from the First Noel Chronicles. It is interesting to note that the Order of Eraldus is perhaps the last remaining thread of a completely trusted institution to exist in today's Atalan Alliance from the Elder Days, revered by all, even across the now separate kingdoms that once made up Atalan once united. Not even the Magi or Shepherds are viewed with such goodwill as an Eraldus rider entering a town or village. Long ago, they served Atalan once united, bringing correspondence, messages, communiques, and often even simply gifts, borne on the backs of their majestic unicorn steeds. Like most things in the years since the fall of the two armies, on the fields of Kamlan 16 years before, and the armistice between Mezzanin and the Atalan alliance that followed, they too have found themselves with but a degree of the influence and power they once held. But hold it, they still do. What irony then, or perhaps it was fitting, that they would be the unwitting bearers of what was to befall that which was once Atalan once united. Chronicled by Maya Swin. This is The First Noel by A. Diallo Jackson. The Promise Help me. The dark early morning wind all but whispered as it wound through the barren trees lining either side of the Sylvan Road leading away from Town's Edge. Walking the rugged, unmarked path just off the main thoroughfare wasn't the wisest of things for Bredana Dare to do. It was quiet, as one should expect just past midnight and at such an early hour, except this, it was too quiet. It was more a stillness. It felt to her like an oppressive hush pressed down upon all that surrounded the whispering woods. It had never felt like this before. The forest always rustled with at least the slightest wrinkling of activity at night, but all around her now was barely but a sound. Even though the world was approaching the deadest of days in winter, and the solstice was just a few weeks away, there should still have been a soft hooting of an owl or the occasional nocturnal song from a nightjar nesting in the trees to balance out the nothing. Or so she at least thought there ought to be. It was strange to her that she would even take notice, not right now, when so many other present matters were more pressing and important. It was not quite alarming. It was merely simply odd. Whatever it was, it was unsettling. It was far from normal for her to be out here, now, in the dead of night. But then again, what do I know of normal, she thought. She had always run as fast as she could from the expected and the mundane. Why should now be any different? In the distance behind her, the flickering lights of the sleeping town of Western Terrace signaled far off warmth and safety. Neither was an option for her at the moment, however. As she moved toward the forest and off the road, she already thought she might be too late. She hoped not. But she never could quite figure out how to be on time anyway, let alone now when anything to help her naturally keep any semblance of time was absent. Stiff fingers cradled a cold ceramic face. She tucked the vessel inward tighter to her chest. Odd, she thought that this one of all things should somehow bring her warmth, both inside and out. Still, she needed more assurance in the moment. With a steady free hand, elbow awkwardly bent, Burdane reached back over her shoulder to assure herself with the one thing of certainty she could count on always. At first, my sword, she thought, but then, no. She searched for a few moments until her hand clasped it, gripping tightly the top end of a long, light tan wooden staff. Her fingers ran deliberate and slow, and with discernment over etchings carved into the weapon. 
It filled her with a sense of certainty. They noticed every sharp groove, edge, and winding curve. She remembered. A flood of memories. There he sat, cross-legged on the cold gray stone hearth in front of a slowly burning home fire. It had been winter then. No. Autumn? He wore over one eye, fastened with a strap of leather around a mop of graying hair, a thick spectacle of round glass. He measured each and every movement of his mallet and chisel as he carefully whittled away small slivers of wood. Raising the staff up to examine his work, he blew away the particles of fine leftover dust, then held it level, eyeing the length of it. Beautiful, he said. Verdane peeked over his shoulder to see the etchings for the very first time. Yes, she remembered with certainty now. It had been autumn. It was in the last few seasons before she became a shepherd candidate and left to live and train at the Orium of Mirmon Men. Ten. She had to have been ten. Just like mother. Her young voice shook. Yes, he said. He had reached back to cradle her head. She nuzzled into his arm and melted down, her chin resting on his broad shoulder. Just like your mother. Her remembrance was next that of a silence filled with sadness. The weight of a recent loss. It matched the one she felt now, tonight, as she walked the path alone holding the vase. He looked at her as if to fill the quiet. He lifted the staff, then took two sharp practice swings and a short bursting forward thrust, always the warrior first. Look, he said. He moved the top end of the staff close to eye level. It's a wind staff. A hollow had been carved into the center of it, Verdane's eye watching the light from the room descending down and ending in a recessed darkness within. Watch, he said. He raised it to his lips, buried beneath a wall of graying beard and whiskers. He then situated his thick callous fingers just so, took one measured inhale, then began to lightly puff. It was a sweet note. A smile began to slowly break through on her face. Now you try. Her mind suddenly jumped ahead to now, tonight, walking alone in the dark. She unslung the windstaff from her back, carefully following the movements of her father's that she remembered. She pursed her lips, drew a cold breath in, then puffed away. The note was flat and bitter, quite like the cold. Her mind flashed back to that night again. Her note then, as now, had sounded the same. It's quite all right, little bean, he had said to her. Just as with everything else, with practice, you will succeed. But, she began. Her mind and thoughts back to the present. She wriggled her fingers and checked her breath. Her heart raced, the vein in her neck strongly pulsed. She had practiced so many hours since that night, but tonight her mind was still on something else. She heard his words as if echoing through her. Remember what I always said. When all else fails, simply close your eyes. Listen to your body. It will never steal you wrong. His distant voice set her just a little bit at ease as she first replaced her windstaff back around her, then pulled her shepherd candidate's cloak in around her head and neck, pulling down tight on the drawstrings, scrunching her face outward like a little swaddled child. It was not quite the time or place, but the thought of how she might have looked almost made her laugh through the stone seriousness of her cold and freezing countenance. But then she remembered, and the longing and pain returned. I will return. Don't you worry, little bean. She sighed, and he was gone. Winter now. It had been almost one year. The very thought of it tripled her heart's aching. She wondered if all that knew her had lied when telling her it would eventually fade. So far, it hadn't. She wasn't sure that it ever would. Gather yourself, she muttered under foggy, cold breath. 
When you see him, you have to be strong. Her boots crunched and slushed through ankle-deep snow mixed with a light smattering of half-frozen mud. By the looks of the path, only a few travelers or passerby would have come this way in the last few days and nights prior. The last snowfall had been a week before, and no tracks could have been covered in that time. Good, she thought. It will be easier to find him. By the light of the waning moon, she made out three, no, four sets of footprints. Two of them were human kin, probably some traveling merchant or perhaps even a pilgrim, not too far-fetched, it being this time of year, taking a shortcut on their way to the Sylvan Road. The footprints possessed the distinct shape of leathered winter boots with soft soles, yet thicker stitching at the sides. The other set, the more fresh of them, were from hooves. She was fairly certain it was him, and it gave her some reassurance she had come the correct way, or at least that he was nearby. The hooves were spaced closely together, telling her the steed he rode had a slow and steady gait when it had passed through. He was not in a hurry. Yet. But then, she turned to the last of the tracks. She hoped it had gone by long before now. Her jaw clenched, the hairs on her neck jolting to attention. Eyes darted back and forth, scanning the dark just beyond, off the trail behind the trees. She quickly turned to assure herself she was still alone, that she wasn't being hunted. Nothing there. A moment of growing ease, she looked ahead again and quickly picked up her pace. Help me. She had learned quite a bit in her shepherd candidate training in the pursuit to become a full-ranking shepherd. But she wasn't sure she was willing to take on a wolf alone. Not tonight. And by the looks of its paw imprint, it was at least three times her size. It was no average wolf, already deadly as they were. It was likely an alpha, a dire wolf, or something worse. It made her sojourn out here now even more foolish than it already was. She stopped, rolled her eyes, and looked upward toward the night sky. Stupid Brid, she said. Stupid, stupid, dumb, stupid Bridane. She grunted a determined groan, then continued. Ahead, a dim light floated from the dark just around the curve of the path. It was a soft, mostly white glow with just a shade of blue. Bredain's pace quickened. It had to be him. She would feel a bit foolish if it wasn't. Point of fact, even if it were someone else that she wasn't expecting, she would still be relieved. It was cold and alone out here. An enemy with a blade even would be nearly as welcome because it wouldn't have been just her alone and instead whatever creature of the forest meant to eviscerate her alive. Perhaps, maybe not so much that thought, but the thought of someone, anyone besides herself, she found comforting. Elaine, she shouted. The light grew more intense. She didn't hold back and she probably was just a bit too eager, no matter. Brother! And there he was. Finally. But then, almost immediately, her excitement faded. Elaine wasn't dressed in his regular, everyday, somewhat unassuming clothes. Shining silver armor covered his chest, forearms, and shins. Beneath it, he wore a familiar green tunic. This was not what she had expected to see. Not in the least. Not tonight. Argo, she said. It was so unexpected that she almost didn't notice at first he sat atop a tall, thinly built regal unicorn. Until she did. What is she doing here? The hoof indentations in the snow were thinner than a horse's, and they didn't rest as deep into the earth as a horse's would. She had been so caught up in the fear of the surrounding dark and the possibility of some creature of the night setting upon her that she didn't even contemplate the obvious that was right there before her. A soft, faint glow bathed the area, gently forcing back creeping shadows from the trees that encroached upon the path. 
The light came from Argo's fine white hair shimmering in slow moving waves, reflecting from Elaine's torch, somehow amplifying and altering it. She had the same feeling she had always had when standing in a unicorn's presence. The moments always felt so dreamlike. Argo stood unmoving except for the long mane that dropped to one side of her head and neck. Not one muscle twitched or flinched. Like a stone statue at attention, Argo stood as though waiting for something of her own accord. Not the riders. The long golden headpiece Argo wore was decorated with ornate looping designs reflecting multiple glinting lights. The glint seemed to move along with a wavy glow from the creature's hair. Argo's long translucent horn protruded out through a thick ringed opening at the top of the headpiece. Runes decorated the horn etched all the way from its base up to its silvery tipped end. Bredain never did quite know what they meant or said, and Elaine never offered to tell her. Argo always freely roamed the area surrounding Western Terrace, only appearing when she was called. Bredain was always in awe of her, but to see her now, she knew what it ultimately meant. May Aramis protect, a deep baritone voice said. It was not Elaine's voice, but another, just around the corner. Elaine faced whoever it was, another rider it must have been, of that Burdain was certain. They only invoked the saying and the first kin's god's name one to another. The very truth that Argo was there already confirmed it to her, but she would keep searching for reasons why it couldn't be so. For Elaine made a promise and tonight was supposed to be for something else. It was meant to be for father. The other rider was larger and much older than Elaine. His extremely distressed face couldn't hide enough behind his strong white beard. The rider turned to see her and immediately covered his mouth and nose with a bright scarf of crimson. Elaine looked to the man and nodded. By Aya's grace, Elaine replied. The other man nodded back. The man pulled back the reins on his own unicorn steed. His was much larger than Argo, a sturdy breed more fitting for the man's sturdy frame. His eyes met Bredain's for just a moment. They were deep black pools that she could have been lost in for an eternity. She could even see it, tell, in the darkness. A something there. Griffin, the man said. Ride. His unicorn clopped its feet sideways until it had turned fully around. It lowered its head, let out a deep whinny, then ran off into the night. And then they were gone. Bredain stood alone with her brother and Argo. Emotions rose. First, puzzled and perplexed. Then, anger. This was not how tonight was supposed to be. This was not how it had been planned. Let me guess. She's sending you, isn't she? Nasir? Bourdain erupted. Finally, Elaine turned toward her. If his face was a word, it would have been regret. Brid. Where? No, wait. Who? She said. Who was that? I'm sorry, little sister, Elaine said. She shuddered. It was all she could do to not erupt at him fully. After all, it wasn't him she was angry with. Not fully. Not truly. No, she began. Tonight, of all nights, and she has to know. When we are called, we answer. No questions. I sent a message to your headmaster. Did you not receive it? No. Pointed and blunt. If Headmaster Morn hadn't told her, she knew the likely reason why. He would have had no idea she had meant to slip away tonight. But still, he withheld it because tomorrow. It was because of tomorrow. Verdane's emotions tumbled. She knew this would be a losing battle. She had fought this fight before and she never won. 
She remembered her father and their last time together. It had been the same, always then, as here now, with Elaine. I will be back in a fortnight, before that even. It is but a simple communique. Simple? They are never simple when she sends you. Verdain realized her fists were clenched. She hated this feeling. Where? Brid, you know that I cannot tell you. It must remain secret. My Eralder's oath. Where? There is much amiss on the horizon that needs to be addressed by all who are privy to such things. He sighed. The regret of his face became obscured by the fog of his breath that floated on the cold night air. I'm sorry, he said. Did you bring it? Of course I did. Why else would I be here? She threw more than a hint of verbal fire. At least one of them intended to honor their plans tonight. Bredain reached into her cloak. The vase had been cradled in a small sling set against her back, just below her rib cage. With two hands, she raised it up to him. It was smooth with a shiny glaze that caused it to hold the cold more than it should. So beautiful, he said. Did you buy it at the market? He loosed his hands from the grips of his reins to take it. The way it catches a hint of the light. Do you see it? It was a gift from father. Don't you even remember when he came back from Talos? Ah, he said. I do. The famed craftsmen of arm truly are the greatest in the Alliance. That was years ago. A vase, now an urn, and a gift to you from him without even knowing its ultimate significance. Verdane had always suspected her father's gifts upon returning from some far off places were sourced from guilt more than anything else, especially once mother had died. She never really bothered to care why though. They were always pretty little exotic things from faraway places that only existed for her in his, and now Elaine's, stories. And she always cherished them, regardless of intent. Elaine examined it closely, turning and rotating it, his face in awe. So intricate, a truly fascinating piece of art. His eyes stopped at the lid. Father would be upset by this, she said. When kings and queens and men of distinction summon, who are we to deny them? A punch to her gut. He played unfair. Brid knew them as father's words, and they were some of the last she had heard him say before the end. She went from feeling righteousness at her side and having it snatched away suddenly, being shown she was wrong. Except she wasn't. How dare he? How dare he use father's words against her? Father understood duty above all else. We are the ones who give them permission to be kings and queens and men and women of distinction. We are the only reason to deny them, because without us, there would be no them. It was a thing she had always wanted to say to her father when he was alive. She felt awful for saying it now. It reminded her that he was gone but it also somehow tarnished the fondness of her memories of him. Curse you, Elaine. I choose to think that he would rather be alive and here with us now, she continued, to spend one more winter with us than for both of us to be here standing in the cold at the edge of town alone in the darkness. For him, first mother, then father, now you. Do what you must, I suppose. Elaine handed the vase back down to her. It no longer felt like a beautiful treasure. It now felt like a somber urn. Accepting it, for her, felt like a defeat. He was really leaving. Less than a fortnight, he said. We can do the ceremony when I get back. It will still be a week yet before the winter tell when I return. Perhaps even sooner. She fumbled inside for words. Anything to convince him to stay. A week from now is not what he wanted. Her voice was as cold as the night air. And we'll never get the time back now, will we? Elaine lowered his head, clenched his lips, and let out a heavy, defeated, warm fog sigh. He breathed, then exhaled again. She knew this. He always did it when he was seeking his calm and center. They command, I follow. 
You know the way. No, she commands and you follow. No one ever asks of you anything but she. She only asks from all of us to hell with the way. She placed the vase back beneath her candidate's cloak. She stopped herself before she said to hell with you. She still had some self-control left, yet at least, not typical, but some. Elaine pulled tight on the reins again. He laid his hand on the head of Argo, gently stroking the side of the unicorn's face. Before the winter tell, he said, I promise. He gave a quick glance her way. She was confident it was meant to be reassuring. He always failed at such things. I truly am sorry, Brid. He guided his steed, turning around toward the path leading out from Western Terrace. He tossed his torch to Bourdain, who caught it with a single, outstretched hand. Good luck tomorrow. Father would be proud. And Mother would wonder why I was following down this godforsaken path the same as the two of you, Omox headed men, Bourdain responded. She let a hint of softening in. They never held a grudge for longer than a few minutes. She walked closer, looking upward into the eyes of her brother. She lifted her other hand and caressed the side of Argo's face. Take care of him, please, friend. The unicorn let out a slight breath through her nose. She leaned her head into Bredain's hand. Elaine, looking down at both of them, smiled. I will return. Don't you worry, little bee, he said. Argo, ride. Argo lowered her head. Bernane stepped back as suddenly Ryder and his steed charged off into the night. The soft, otherworldly reflective glow of Argo's hair dimmed in the distance. West. That meant likely he was headed toward Traveler's Inn and perhaps boarding a ship across the sea. At least that much she could gather. At least that little bit. She then looked back toward Western Terrace. This time she didn't care of some creature of the night emerging from the darkness to kill her. She didn't care what happened now. She was alone. Again. Help me. She hated the solstice and all of its celebrations. It was just a reminder to her of how much she had lost at each turning of the winter. First mother, then father. On the horizon to the east, the dark blanket of night already turned to just a slighter hue of blue. It would be dawn soon. It didn't feel like it, however. It felt instead like the light would never come. Then, it was strange. It was something, a soft push, a tug at her heart, and a gentle nudge turning her chin. It felt, she looked into the cold, dark forest. Help! It was soft, yet deep, with a gentle, rumbly sound. It did not scare her and it did not frighten her. She focused on her still rising anger. It filled her with rage enough that she forgot about the bitter cold. Misting fog propelled from her mouth and nose. Her thoughts grew jumbled, her senses wild. She decided in that instant that she no longer cared. Help me. She covered her head and her shepherd candidate cloak tighter again, protecting her from the outside, burying her face inside. She looked down at the snow and spotted the track of the creature she had seen earlier. It led off the road and into the forest toward the whisper. It was likely a trap, a lure to draw an innocent traveler in. I hate the winter tell, she said. Bredain looked toward Western Terrace one last time, then made her way into the opposite direction toward the trees, disappearing into the dark, foreboding forest of night. And I hate Magus Nasir. And then she was gone. Thank you for listening to The First Noel. The First Noel was written by A. Diallo Jackson. Sound production by Premise Play Productions. The First Noel theme by Marianthi Bezeridis. Join our Patreon and please be so wonderful to like and subscribe. Thank you and see you next episode. Next time, the question.